Our population is changing, demographics are changing, we're treating increasingly more elderly and population with more concurrent illnesses. You've all heard about diabetes, we're looking at more patients with diabetes and the complications thereof. We're looking at more patients with respiratory illnesses um, and um, cardiac problems. And to be able to offer those patients the um, treatments that we should be offering them, the increasingly complex chemotherapy, systemic therapy, radiotherapy, we need to be able to draw on the expertise of our colleagues in the acute sector. And this is particularly for our inpatients. At the moment, if you're an inpatient at Clatterbridge and you develop a, 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 an unrelated medical problem such as chest pain, you have to be transferred to Arrow Park Hospital um, to be assessed. In the last year, 67 patients required transfer to Arrow Park Hospital for assessment. Now, it may be safe medically, but that is not a good patient experience, and we don't feel that that's good practice. And so we need to change that. We need to be able to, to situate our inpatient bed base adjacent to an acute hospital, hence building a new um, hospital in Liverpool. Another important strand is research and development. You'll have all heard the Christie, you'll have all heard of the Marsden. If you go out of this area, people haven't heard of Clatterbridge, and that's because while we are well loved by our population, the population that we serve, we have um, somewhat undersold ourselves in the past in terms of research and development. And one of the problems is because we are on the periphery of our population, we are on the periphery of um, the, the, the health care economy, if you like, of uh, Merseyside, situated where we are, we have not been able to attract high-flying academic doctors who do the research, who develop the new drugs, who develop the new radiotherapy techniques um, to Clatterbridge. They've chosen to go to the Christie and the Marsden. Now, even, even with this, um, the prospect of the new cancer centre, we've actually started to attract academics. So it took us 10 years of um, interviewing, showing people around to get our first chair of medical oncology. They were appointed a couple of years ago. But I know, speaking to, to Professor Palmer, he would not have come without this transforming cancer care agenda that we have. Um, and we really need to be able to develop the research and development agenda as a modern cancer hospital because all our patient care is based on good, a good R and D foundation. Mm -hmm. um, th those are the those are the main two big headline issues. There are many other issues for it that I'll, I'll touch on, but I won't go to, into too much detail. Um, for example, medical students as medical students in Liverpool, you don't get you don't they don't come over to Clatterbridge, they don't see oncology, which is. Um, which is com completely unacceptable when we know we all have a one in three lifetime chance of getting cancer. They don't experience, they don't get experience of on oncological care and they also don't develop um, a desire to do oncology as their career because you often decide what you want to do as a junior, uh, what you want to do um, when you're a consultant, when you're actually a medical student. I certainly did. I trained in Leicester and that's where I, when I decided to be an oncologist. And we, so we miss out in that respect. Um, we miss out on certain innovations such as interoperative radiotherapy, which is where the radiotherapy is given at the time of surgery because we have this separation between surgery and our radiotherapy. The list is endless. I could go on. I won't. Um, th there will be time for questions. I'm very happy to answer any questions that you may have about the clinical case. Thank you. I'll hand you over back to the end. Thank you. I just wanted to finish off with just a couple of words on the, uh, on the time scale of the process and then obviously questions. Uh, working backwards, um, if we were to implement what we're proposing at the moment, then with respect to um, both the new cancer centre in Liverpool and the uh, redesign of the existing Clatterbridge Cancer Centre um, at Bennington, uh, we would um, hope to be able to open the doors of the new Liverpool Cancer Centre in and around September 2018. And then with the, the redesign of the existing Clatterbridge Cancer Centre, which, as Nikki said, will, will remain as an important site, that would take probably about another nine to 12 months. So that would take us into 2019. So working backwards from that, 
we expect to uh, need to develop a full business case, uh, really from um, the, the earlier to, to middle part of next year on to uh, the middle of 2016, which is the point where we would hope to start construction uh, of the new Cancer Centre in Liverpool. Um, the, the, the full business case is, is the stage of detailed design. In order to get to that, there's quite a number of important things that we need to do. Uh, we need to um, have completed our outline business case, and in order to complete our outline business case, we need to have conducted uh, a formal public consultation. Obviously, a really important part of that process as well, which is very material to why we're here today, is the scrutiny of what we're proposing by people such as yourselves, um, which um, will uh, be, we've obviously um, earlier in, uh, in the year asked for that to commence. Uh, so, so the timescales for that, uh, we had initially hoped that uh, we would make a, a, a final decision uh, with respect to um, Clatterbridge uh, in the, the earlier part of 2015. We're now expecting that to be probably slightly later than that, uh, so we recognise that we will need to come back and formally advise you of that date. Um, and so um, consistent with that, uh, when we wrote to you initially, uh, we suggested that the timescale that we might um, need a response from yourselves with respect to scrutiny of this might be early November. I think um, being uh, entirely um, sensible about timescales, I think we, uh, we expect that that will move back slightly as well, but again we will uh, we'll come back and, and formally notify you of what those um, uh, proposed revised dates would be. So working back from that, uh, we uh, are planning uh, and hope to go out to formal public consultation later in this month uh, and then that will obviously allow time for that to be conducted, written up and then submitted to, uh, to the uh, scrutiny process in time for, uh, for a response to be um, formulated by, um, by the scrutiny process and, and fed back to ourselves. So those are the, um, those are the time scales that we're, we're hoping to work to and obviously what we understand we're here to, to help you do tonight is to determine whether what we're proposing is um, a substantial change in terms of service. Uh, I mean, clearly, uh, that's um, uh, not wishing to, to second guess in any way your decision. Um, I mean, I have to be honest and say we think it's a, a substantial change, but obviously that's that's for yourselves um, to, to determine. But uh, as I've said, um, if we can help with any questions uh, in order to, to help you get to, to make that decision, or, or obviously any wider questions, then we're all happy to, to answer those. Thank you very much indeed. Um, can I um, ask mm -hmm. Mr. Bernard to have a look if you've got any questions to ask? And just um, draw your attention to page 19 of the uh, cover report, which sets out the recommendations. I'm going to ask you to, um, to look at it in a minute. Does anybody want to ask a question? Yes, Walter. And then Phil will tell us. Thanks very much, John. Um, I noticed travel features quite a lot in your report. Um, one of the things that struck me is that if you know, you, you, a medical condition, it seems to me that travel is of no consequence when it comes to your health. It's a bit like education. You find that uh, if you want a school and you're interested in a child's uh, education, travel becomes insignificant. It's amazing how you know, people travel because it's what they want and what they need. So. Um, I think I would discount the travel, which seems to figure very strongly in the report we make. Um, I can see the point that uh, you make about the, the, the emergency services that um, patients may need uh, if they're being treated at Clatterbridge. Um, I mean, it, 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 is it not possible to provide those facilities? I think about, uh, when I read your report, um, it says this is no longer possible for Catholics, so I will arrive. So why can't we have those? Because uh, I just want to finish off by saying that uh, I, I have reason to visit Catholics on a regular basis. My wife has been using the services there. She was operated on in uh, the war, and uh, she's had continuing service at Catholics, so you know, I have experience with both. Um, why can't we provide this? Is it only canonical? Or is there, is there a lack of uh, the skills now? Um, it's, it's just the, um, the practicalities and logistics. The problem is um, that 
we need access to certain people 24 hours a day. So say if you developed an, um, a, uh, abdominal pain and we needed a general surgeon to review you, that might happen at, at three o'clock in the morning. Um, so we need 24 hour cover. We need 24 hour cover for surgery, for respiratory medicine, for cardiology, for renal medicine, for ITU, which I haven't gone into detail. But So all these things um, require staff on rotors, bearing in mind the European Working Time Directive as well. We can't have one person who's on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So there has to be rotors. We actually looked at this in our options appraisal, and it is, um, it, it, as I'm sure you can imagine, it's incredibly expensive, but it's impractical because even if you paid somebody to do that, they wouldn't want to do it because they might have, if there's 67 patients altogether that we transferred out um, last year, but of those, uh, you know, maybe they, they all required a number of different special specialists. So for an individual specialist, um, they, may see, they may be required two or three times a month. And, it, and you, so you need people who are doing the on-call in the main hospital to, to be able to come and see your patients in situ. And then you could say, well, why don't we just call upon the doctors at Arrow Park? But unfortunately, if, you, if, if you're working at Arrow Park and you call to Cutteries, that's half a day, practically, out of your day. So you might be doing clinics, you might be working in A&E, you have other emergencies to see. As you know, Arrow Park is incredibly busy. So all these things conspire against us being able, you need a hospital next door. It's not just a couple of consultants on call. Actually, when you look at it, you just need a hospital. Yeah. 
churching leave, but it is important. I would suggest that because um, our, a lot of our Liverpool patients will be being treated in Liverpool, um, it may be a little bit easier to park. <laughs> Expecting pretty much all of the, the staff who we employ directly um, to be to continue to be employed. Um, so obviously people may change their place of work, uh, but we're not expecting uh, in the main to be a reduction. The area where I have to um, distinguish is in the um, what we call the FM services, um, you know, catering, cleaning, that sort of stuff. Now at the moment those staff are not um, our staff. We actually have those services provided to us uh, by a service level agreement from um, the, uh, the Royal Trust next door. Now, self-evidently, uh, if we um, no longer have inpatient beds on site, then we will need patient catering for inpatients. But the numbers of staff that I think that we're talking about there are very small, and we've already made contact with the Royal Trust in order to um, talk to them about how best we can manage um, to keep you know, any potential impact on staff uh, to be as little as it possibly can be. I mean, clearly there would be, uh, I mean, you, you, you I suspect know more about things like Chufi than I do because it, it's hugely complicated. Um, there would obviously be, you know, scope for that, but at the same time we've got to be realistic and recognise that, you know, for those staff, um, even although, you know, we might be saying, well, you know, you, you could have a, a job over in Liverpool, for example, they might not feel that that was, that was appropriate. So the, the, I think the, for, for the vast majority of staff, um, no, we're still, um, they, they, we would still expect them to continue, but be a, potentially a different place of work. Uh, I think that you know, because of the, the nature of the, the, the FM staff that we're talking about, things might be a little different, and, and we recognise that well. As I said, we, you know, we started the discussions to try and make sure that that is, um, you know, the, the impact of that is as minimal as it possibly can be. I, 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 I don't want to talk about it, I'm sorry, but I'm very happy to, to get that information for you. Um, can I just say that I think uh, the positive uh, side of this is the research side of it. Um, Casterbridge has always been the poor system to Christie. Uh, nobody said that Casterbridge has ever had a good shout the praises of Christie's. So perhaps the shout the praises of Casterbridge could be a sound line.
Um, I, I meant this in terms of the red tape, so rather than going through it line by line and section by section, just to give you an overview of how text of NHS England and what we do. Um, we've completed our first year of NHS England, as I'm sure every 